Hey everyone, in this presentation we are going to discuss the judicious use of drugs in food animals. It's not the most exciting topic in the world, but it is really important. So grab an extra cup of coffee if you need and let's get started. So why should we care? Well, regardless of your veterinary area of interest, you should all be aware by now that there are implications and restrictions to using drugs in food producing species that do not apply to others. So why do we care about using drugs in a judicious manner? Well, there are several reasons. First, there could be dangers associated with drugs and products that are consumed by people. And this is what I think most people think of when we ask the question. These could be dangers associated with reactions in people with hypersensitivities to certain drugs. And these are extremely rare, but certainly can be possible. More commonly, resistance to antimicrobials that can be developed if exposed to chronic low levels of, of antimicrobial drugs, which ultimately limit a physician's ability to treat infections in people, is perhaps the most commonly cited reason or need for eliminating antibiotic residue in, in these consumable products. Also something that needs to be considered are potentially sociologic impacts. And there's a public perception that products that are produced organically or without the use of antibiotics microbials, GMOs, or potentially just raised in alternative environments like free range are necessarily better than others. And while this is not necessarily true, it can certainly drive markets and is currently the topic of a lot of debate. Lastly, animal welfare needs need to be considered when we have a comprehensive discussion regarding pharmaceutical use in food producing animals. We can consider animal welfare concerns when using drugs to enhance production. And we can also consider animal welfare that might be impacted from failure to treat. And this can be especially true when considering organic operations where treatment of many conditions are not possible because of the inability to use certain drugs. For purposes of this presentation, we are gonna discuss the legality issues and specific rules and regulations that are in effect regarding the use of drugs in food producing animals. Violations are real. And this is an example of a warning letter sent to a producer, um, a producer actually located here in Ohio by the FDA. And these are available online if you are interested, but the, the, the real point is that violations happen and, and hopefully we can, by understanding the laws, understanding the rules and regulations, and a little bit about how the process works, hopefully we can uh, avoid these. So let's start with, well, I guess we've already started. Let's continue with some definitions of some commonly used terms. First, ELDU or ELUD stands for extra label drug use. AMDUCA stands for the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act. And this gives us as veterinarians the ability to use drugs in an extra label manner. FARAD stands for the Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank. And this is an organization that is very valuable when it comes to trying to establish withdrawal times after we've used drugs in an extra label manner. They have a website that can be found at www.farad.org. So if you open up your web browser, and in the search box type www.farad spelled correctly um, dot org it will take you to the farad website web page and if you scroll down um, you will see a series of buttons request advice search vetgram uh, search digests and citations um, if you click on search vetgram this is useful for finding information that is actually printed on the label. So a nice concise place online that you can search for the labels. 
and you can click on type search and then search by different search criteria, product name. Um, if you type in the product name like Flanixon, um, you can type that there and hit search. This will bring up all of the products that, that contain Flanixon. And you, most commonly, we use Banamine injectable, so I can click view. And that basically brings up the label information for Banamine injectable solution. And you can look at uh, how it's used in different species and the approved routes of administration, indication, directions, etc. So this is information that's actually printed on the label. So if you read the label, you can you can find that. Um, if you go back and uh, basically back to the home page. What I find more useful, um, especially if we're using drugs in an extra label manner, is this request advice. And if we click on that, um, that brings up uh, it brings us up to this page. And basically, this allows us to submit a request to Farad. And if we click on the submit request button again there. Um, that will bring us to up to a page where we can enter in information, our information, our contact information, um, as well as the, the species that we're using a drug in in an actual label manner, the uh, drug that we're using, the route of administration, the dose, and all of that pertinent information and submit that and Farad will get back with you regarding what they recommend to use as a withdrawal interval on various drugs. And so this is a really, really useful tool that we as veterinarians can use to establish withdrawal times or withdrawal intervals in these animals. You probably already know what a lactating dairy cow is. However, the FDA defines lactating dairy cow probably a little bit different than you do. Basically, the FDA defines a lactating dairy cow as one of the six major dairy cow breeds. So Holstein, Jersey, Brown Swiss, Guernsey, Ayrshire, and Milking Shorthorn that is 20 months of age or older. This can be a cow in her dry period. This can be a five-year-old virgin heifer that has never been bred, that is not lactating, that is a pet, and she is still considered to be a lactating dairy cow if she is one of the five major, six major dairy breeds. And therefore, we need to be careful and we need to follow recommendations and abide by the rules and regulations that pertain to lactating dairy cows. Withdrawal time or withdrawal interval, basically that is the time between the last administration of a drug and when the animal can be slaughtered or when milk can be shipped from that animal. So only one of these animals, and that would be the cow in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, is actually a lactating dairy cow. She is actively lactating, she's got milk in her udder, and she is a Holstein, and she's older than 20 months of age. The heifer that's immediately below her is less than 20 months of age. And even though she is a Holstein heifer, she is not considered by the FDA to be a lactating dairy cow. Nor is the lactating cow on the lower right-hand side of the screen, even though she's lactating, this is a cow of a beef breed and is not considered by the FDA to be a lactating dairy cow. And for obvious reasons, the bull in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Even though he's Holstein, he is not considered a lactating dairy cow. The FDA divides agricultural species into two broad categories, major species and minor species. Major species are the animals that you think of when you think of animal products entering the, the food chain commonly in the US. And so this would comprise cattle, pigs, and poultry. The minor species are basically everything else. 
Now, there's a lot more scrutiny when it comes to oversight on the, the major species. And for the most part, minor species are, are not looked at very closely. However, one of the big things that, that need to be considered, especially when we're talking about a minor species where we oftentimes extrapolate our knowledge in, in animal or uh, drug use from our major species because oftentimes minor species do not have a label for the drugs that we are using. If the drug does not have a label for a given species, the FDA permitted tolerance in those animals is actually zero, meaning any drug residue that's found in those animals is considered in violation of FDA limits. As we said before, AMDUCA stands for the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act, and this allows us as veterinarians to use drugs in an extra label manner. There are several things that must be present in order for us to fall back on AMDUCA. First of all, we need to use a drug within the context of a valid VCPR. Therefore, th th we cannot prescribe a drug in an extra label manner just based on a phone conversation. We need to have a relationship with the client and we need to have at least seen the animal or be comfortable and familiar with, with the animal and the environment that this animal is in. Extra label drug use is limited to circumstances when the health of the animal is threatened or suffering may result from a failure to treat. Therefore, we cannot use animal, uh, drugs in an extra label manner if we are just looking to enhance production um, and things along those lines. Third, no approved drug is labeled for use or the labeled use is clinically ineffective. An example of this is the use of penicillin, procaine penicillin in food producing animals. We always use penicillin in an extra label manner. We know that at the label dosage, which is 10 to 12,000 units per kilogram, it is basically clinically ineffective for almost everything that, that we treat in food animals. And therefore we always go at a higher than label dosage. But if there is a drug that is approved and labeled for an animal, we should fall back on that label indication before we choose a drug in an extra label manner. Fourth, we need to understand that if we are using a drug in an extra label manner, the withdrawal time that is indicated on the drug is not applicable any longer and we need to establish a new withdrawal time and we need to take measures to that assure that the assigned withdrawal times are going to be followed. And Fifthly, there are certain drugs that are prohibited from use in an extra label manner. These are those drugs, and it's a good idea to at least be somewhat familiar with the drugs on this list. Not that you have to have each one of them memorized, but to be able to at least recognize these drugs and say, hey, I think clenbuterol is one of those drugs that we're not supposed to be using in, in food producing animals is, is very useful. One of the drugs that I will draw your attention to are the fluoroquinolones or the group of drugs um, are the fluoroquinolones, most commonly Batril. Batril does have a use in food producing animals. However, and we're going to talk about this later, it has a label and we need to adhere to the label directions very closely. Any deviation from that label is strictly prohibited because it is on this list. All of these other drugs like the nitromidazoles, like metronidazole, nitrofurazones, these 
do not have a label for use in food producing animals. Therefore, any use of these drugs in food animals is extra label and therefore prohibited. These are drugs with restricted extra label drug use. So these drugs do have a label and they can in some way, um, deviations from the label are possible. However, other deviations are, are prohibited. And the one that I use as an example, the one that, that's most commonly used are cephalosporins especially third generation cephalosporins in, in food producing animals with most notably the drug ceftiofur. And with this drug, with ceftiofur, we can use the drug for indications not printed on the label. Therefore, it is considered an extra label use of drug. However, we need to follow to a T the route of administration, the dosage, the frequency of administration. Any deviation in dose, route, and frequency of ceftiofur is considered an illegal use of that drug. The other one that is can be used, and I will bring your attention to it because it's commonly used in horses, is phenylbutazone or bute. It is an NSAID um, that's again commonly used in horses to treat orthopedic or musculoskeletal type pain. It can be used, although not recommended, it is legal to use it in non-lactating dairy cows. However, I will caution you that the withdrawal time is somewhat erratic and there are better choices than in most instances that, than using butte. However, it is illegal to use it in lactating dairy cows. So any of the major dairy breeds that uh, in a, that's a female 20 months of age or older, the use is strictly prohibited. It is important for you to be familiar with the label of the drugs that you will be using. So what's actually included on the label? First of all, the name of the drug, both the trade name and the actual drug name, the concentration of drug, the route of administration, the species that you are allowed, and if there are any species that or a production class of animal that are is prohibited from use of that particular drug, that should be indicated on the label, as well as the indications are printed on the label. And we used Batril as an example here um, of the, the label. And it says that Batril is used or in, is indicated for the treatment of bovine respiratory disease associated with a list of organisms. I get the question a lot, you know, since they have a list of organisms here, is it important that we culture and know for sure exactly what organism we're treating? And actually the FDA doesn't mandate that we have laboratory data to say this is exactly the organism. However, from a clinical standpoint, we need to have respiratory disease present in these animals to be able to use this drug um, according to, to label indications. And I will remind you that Batril is one of the drugs that is on the prohibited from extra label drug use list. And so we need to follow this label uh, very much um, to, uh, to a T. Remember, if you deviate from the label in any way, you are using that drug in an extra label fashion. So let's talk about some specific drugs, some of the common drugs that we use in food animals. First of all, let's start by talking about banamine. Most of this discussion is gonna be around antimicrobials, but one of the most common drugs that we use is an NSAID. And this is the only NSAID that actually has a label for food producing animals. It actually, however, does not have a label for pain 
which is the thing that we use it for very frequently, um, especially in a hospital setting where many of our animals are recovering from surgery and we're trying to, to treat pain associated with, with surgical site inflammation. It, if you look at the label and read the label closely, it actually has a label for cattle for the control of fever or pyrexia associated with bovine respiratory disease, endotoxemia, and mastitis. And so if you are using it to control pain or just generalized inflammation that is not associated with a fever in these animals, we are actually using it in an extra label manner. The other thing that I want to draw your attention is that banamine or flonexin, when given by the injectable route, when using the injectable formulation, it is to be administered in cattle via the IV route only. And it is actually illegal to give it by sub-Q or IM injection. Farad periodically publishes these Farad digests in JAVMA, and they're also available on the website that we talked about earlier. But in one of the digests, it actually says that convenience of route of administration is not considered a valid reason for extra label drug use. And therefore, we can't say, oh, just because we can't hit a vein, or it's inconvenient to hit a vein, or it's easier to give it uh, sub Q, that we can just give it by a different route. Um, we, in cattle, it has to be given IV. There is a new banamine product that has recently come out. It's transdermal or, or a poron banamine. And it actually does have a label for not only the control of pyrexia associated with respiratory disease, but also pain associated with foot rot in, in uh, non-lactating dairy cows. And so this is another NSAID product that we can now add to our arsenal. Um, but again, if it does not have pain associated with, uh, with lameness or, or foot rot, um, we are actually using this product in an extra label manner as well. ResFloor is a flonixin product that also contains fluorphenicol and so it has an antibiotic combined with an NSAID. It is actually labeled for a single subcutaneous injection and if you're using fluorphenicol which is the product marketed as new fluor along with Flonixin, this may be a better choice um, of, of antibiotic slash NSAID combination than the individual products because this can be given legally as a subcutaneous injection. However, this is not labeled as is Nuflor. Um, it is not labeled for lactating dairy cows. So. You have to be careful with that, and it gives a meat withdrawal of 38 days. Phenylbutazone, also known as Bute, it is another NSAID very commonly used in horses to treat musculoskeletal type pain. What I want to draw your attention to uh, with this drug is that although it can be used in beef animals, although probably not recommended since banamine or flonixin is actually labeled for use in, in cattle, it is illegal to use it in lactating dairy cows. And so don't contact Farad asking for a withdrawal time for milk because they will not give that to you and uh, they will say that banamine should have been used or flonixin should have been used instead. We already talked a little bit about Batril and you've seen this label already in a previous slide, but remember that Batril cannot be used in an extra label manner whatsoever. And so what we need to pay attention to is the route of administration it is for subcutaneous use in beef cattle and non-lactating dairy cows. And it emphasizes here that it is not to be used in female dairy cows 20 months of age or older. 
and to do so would be an extra label use of drug and it would be illegal to do so using using Batril. Also, the indication is clearly printed on the label. It is for treatment of respiratory disease. If the animal does not have respiratory disease, it is illegal to use Batril. And so we need to be very careful that we follow the label instructions um, when using uh, enterofloxacin. No extra label drug use permitted. Aminoglycosides. The problem with aminoglycosides is that it has a very long and variable withdrawal. It is technically, to my understanding, not illegal to use them in food producing animals. However, there's somewhat of a voluntary ban by the American Association of Bovine Practitioners saying we will not use these drugs because we understand that they have a very long withdrawal time. It is hard to predict when the drugs will be cleared from the system and uh, FARAD um, gives an 18 month slaughter withdrawal. And if you think about what 18 months is, I mean, it's well over a year, almost to closer to two years. And it is hard to really, if not impossible, even with great records, to know what is going to happen and to control what happens with that animal in this long period of time. And so we need to be very, very cautious um, if these drugs are used um, to make sure that, that these extremely long withdrawal times are adhered to. And so most of us uh, do not use aminoglycosides, genomycin being the, the most common one in uh, food producing animals. So let's talk a little bit about how production class affects the withdrawal time. And we talked before that for minor species or species that do not have a label, any residue that is detected is actually considered in violation. And this is very similar and, and really the same argument can be made when we actually switch production classes and use drugs in a production class that is not labeled for that specific drug. Most commonly, when we use drugs that are labeled for beef cattle only in dairy producing animals. And this is another Farad Digest excerpt, and it says here, in the case of extra label drug use um, of a drug that is not licensed for any indication in that species, the established tolerance is zero. So this also applies um, to uh, different, different production classes as well, um, in addition to, to species. So if it says not for use in lactating dairy cow, and we use a drug that may not be technically illegal to use in a lactating dairy cow, realize that any residue that is picked up either in milk or even in slaughter of that animal, that lactating dairy cow, when she has fulfilled her productive life and eventually goes to slaughter, if they pick up any residue in that animal, that is considered in violation, even though that same residue may be below the established tolerance for a beef animal, it is not so for a dairy animal. And so we have to be very careful. The example that I use to illustrate this is fluorophenicol or new floor as it is marketed. It is a drug, an antibiotic that we use very commonly in beef animals. And it says on the label for intramuscular and subcutaneous use in beef and non-lactating dairy cows only. However, it is not on the prohibited drug list that we talked about before. And so technically, if this is the only drug that is efficacious to treat a certain disease, we could arguably use it in a lactating dairy cow. However, if that lactating dairy cow would eventually go to slaughter and they picked up, even if, we have, if we've adhered to the beef cow recommendations for withdrawal time and that animal would go to slaughter and it would be below 
and found to be below the tolerance for a beef animal, but still detectable, it is considered in violation of the FDA tolerance for dairy cows because the tolerance for dairy cows is established at zero since it's not labeled for that production class. And so we have to be really careful when we, when we switch, switch production classes and we have to be similarly careful when we switch species um, in species that are not labeled for that specific drug. And just to zoom in, it says do not use if you forget what a lactating dairy cow is as defined by the FDA. It says do not use in female dairy cows 20 months of age or older. Finally, I'd like to talk about cephalosporins. And remember that cephalosporins are on a restricted extra label drug use list. And what does this mean? Well, we can change the, and use it in an extra label manner when it comes to the indication printed on the label. However, we cannot vary in the frequency, the duration, or the route of administration. The most common cephalosporin is a third generation cephalosporin called ceftiafur. The claim to fame of ceftiafur is that it does not penetrate a healthy blood milk barrier. And so this will not get into the udder in any appreciable, uh, any appreciable concentration. And therefore it has, these products have zero milk withdrawal, at least the injectable systemic products have zero milk withdrawal. Obviously the intramammary preparations when we inject it right into the udder will have a withdrawal associated with them. But because of the essentially zero milk withhold on these animals, they are used very commonly in lactating dairy cows. However, we need to pay careful attention to the, the use of, of these drugs, especially when it comes to the frequency, the route, and the, the dose of administration because any deviation is considered extra label and it is actually illegal since it's on the restricted extra label drug use list. All of these products, Naxel, XNL, Exceed, and Spectrumast have the same active ingredient. They're all ceftiafur. They are different formulations and they all have different labels. Naxel, which is sodium ceftiafur, dissolves as a solution. We used to be able to, before the regulations and restrictions on cephalosporins, we used to be able to give this IV. We can no longer do that. It is illegal to do so because it's deviating from the route of administration that's published on the label. XNL, which is ceftiafur hydrochloride, it cannot go IV, not only because it is illegal to do so, but because it is a suspension, um, as is Exceed, which is ceftiafur crystalline free acid, and it would be harmful if given IV. However, both of these products have different routes of administration. XNL can be given sub-Q anywhere. However, Exceed must be given in the fat pad behind the ear. And the claim to fame with Exceed, in addition to not getting into the udder, is that it is more long acting. And so this has a, a, a longer duration of action and it basically can be given um, as a, a single dose or more commonly if treating metritis or following the metritis label, it's actually given at two doses, 72 hours apart. And it is also illegal to omit the second dose um, since we're following and we need to adhere to the, to the label uh, instructions. Spectrumast is marketed as an intramammary infusion. 
it comes either as, in an LC, which stands for lactating cow, or a DC dry cow formulation. Make sure you do not give the DC or the dry cow formulation to a cow that's lactating or she's gonna have a withdrawal time that is unpleasant. And the these also, we need to adhere to the, the label directions. We used to be able to put these in wounds or give them, uh, use them more kind of topically. Keep in mind, it is now illegal to do so because that is not a label route of administration. So we've reached the end of this presentation. I know that it's not the most exciting topic to listen to, however, it is very important. And I hope that you found this presentation to be informative and hopefully uh, it will keep us out of trouble. Thank you for listening. Bye now.